Alrighty. So hello, welcome everybody to the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. Today we're going to be talking about esports medicine. I'm Dana. I'm the Pete Sports Medicine Fellow at Northwestern and Lurie Children's and will be your moderator today. This lecture is sponsored by the AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee, which is co-sponsored by the Education Committee and the Fellowship Committee. So these lectures should serve as an adjunct to your fellowship program's normal education, provide direct access to some experienced uh, sports medicine members and guest speakers and assist in your CAQ exam preparation. So before we start, a few quick reminders, mute your microphone, turn off your video. You can submit questions at any time throughout. And at the end of the talk, I as the moderator will go through the chat and based on the questions we'll uh, talk about them with Dr. Moore. And after the program, I'll send an evaluation link. If you could fill it out, that would be great. So to introduce you to our expert speaker today, Dr. Melita Moore is a quadruple board certified physician in PM&R, sports medicine, brain injury medicine, and lifestyle medicine. She served as a team physician in the NBA 2K League, the WNBA, and the NBA G League. She's the CEO and founder of Levels Unlocked Enterprises and the executive director of Health eGamer Foundation, whose emphasis is on esports and STEM through a wellness lens. She has been instrumental in introducing the subspecialty of esports medicine and having been one of the select team physicians of a professional esports team in the United States, she is an international leader on health and wellness for gamers in the field of esports medicine. She's also an editor for the Handbook of Esports Medicine and a board member as well as chair of the Health and Wellness Commission for the Global Esports Federation. So with that, thank you so much, Dr. Moore, for being here, and I will let you take it away. Dana, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so excited to be able to speak to the fellows this evening. Um, you know, Dana and I, we go back to our UC Davis days, so I appreciate you reaching out to ask me to uh, give a talk on esports medicine. And I see um, my wonderful mentor, Dr. Tanji, the father of sports medicine here. So we're happy to see you, Dr. Tanji, and hopefully everyone will be able to learn something about esports medicine today. All right. Um, here are my disclosures. Uh, as Dana mentioned, I'm on the board and the chair of the Health and Wellness Commission for Global Esports Federation. I'm also an advisory member for an esports global fund, uh, a medical advisory board member for International Hospital Group, and the CEO of Levels Unlocked Enterprises. So these are our learning objectives for today. So I'm excited to talk about esports medicine. And for any fellow who may not know, or anyone who may not know what esports is, we're, we're going to learn that today. Um, we're going to hopefully gain knowledge about the gaming and esports injury. We're going to talk about this 2020 rule and common esports injuries. Uh, but before we go forward, I do want to acknowledge today um, from the United Nations the International Day of Sport uh, for Development and peace. And so typically you raise a white card uh, in honor of peace through sport. And we just really need to be able to appreciate and understand that uh, sport is powerful um, and that we need peace in the world right now. So if anyone has their white card, we hope that uh, you can wave it. Dr. Tanji has his. Uh, and so we are acknowledging peace and sport today. Esports and gaming. So oh, let me move this thingy. Okay. Um, <laughs> esports, there we go, or not. Okay, there we go. So there is a difference between esports and gaming. And so esports, it's an organized competitive video gaming. And gaming is just what most people do when they're at home um, doing traditional video gaming. So esports, it's organized competitive video gaming. Usually the esports athletes, uh, or e-athletes, that's controversial in the esports world. Some of the gamers like to be called e-athletes, athletes, esports athletes, e athletes, or some just like to be called gamers or players, um, but they are professional athletes. And so I know this looks like a bunch of um, funny words under here, this LOL doesn't mean laugh out loud. Uh, these are actually game titles. And so when we talk about esports, this competitive video gaming, there's usually certain genres of gaming. And so those could be first person shooter games. They could be battle royale or strategy type games. So this LOL means League of Legends. Um, COD is Call of Duty. 
uh, CSGO is Counter-Strike Go, Dota 2, and NBA 2K. So if you've never heard of these titles, this these are what esports players they compete in. Um, the other very important thing, because you will get really um, talked really badly about in the esports world with regard to how you spell esports. And so we typically see it um, various ways. A lot of times we see a lowercase e and a capital S. That is incorrect. Esports is a sport, just like basketball or football. So if it's in the middle of a sentence, it's lowercase. If it's at the beginning of a sentence, it's uppercase an uppercase E. So just remember that it's just any other type of sport. So um, if you are doing any publishing or any research, just make sure that we are spelling esports correctly. People are a stickler in the industry for that. There are over 3 billion gamers worldwide. That's half of the population or people that identify as gamers. I myself am not a gamer. And people ask me, well, how are you taking care of these professional uh, gamers? And I say, I I'm not an NFL or NBA player either, but I do know how to take care of an ACL and a mechanism of injury and how to treat it. So I tell people the same thing. Um, I am in my gaming chair today just because we're having this lecture. So this is a beautiful chair um, for my ergonomically correct setup. And so 64% of American households own a video game device, which is crazy. 60% um, of Americans say they play video games. And in 2021, Americans spent $60 billion on video gaming. So I'm really grateful that Dana asked me to do this talk because if you aren't aware of esports and gaming, this is certainly what we are seeing. This is the, it's not a trend, um, it's here to stay and more so especially uh, during COVID or since COVID. Uh-oh, okay. When we talk about gaming types, there's three different major gaming types. One is PC gaming, so that you do on your laptop or your PC setup. The other is console, which most people are familiar with, so an Xbox or a PlayStation or the Nintendo Switch, and mobile gaming. So AARP put out a stat in 2019 that there are 55 million Americans over the age of 55 that mobile game more than four hours a day. So that is, we are talking about this, this is across the age spectrum when we're talking about gaming, a lot of mobile gaming. Um, and so the casual mobile gaming and all people are doing Candy Crush or Pokemon or Words with Friends or Wordle, that's actually mobile gaming. Um, but when you're playing a video, a, a video game title, India is huge for mobile gaming, uh, China, Africa. And so that's where we really see the most of the mobile gaming, but we're starting to see it worldwide. This is the stadium. So you all as fellows might be used to being courtside um, on the sideline. This is now the new sideline. And so this is actually a setup of the NBA 2K League. And as Dana mentioned, um, I was a team physician for the NBA 2K team here in Washington, DC called Wizards District Gaming. Uh, I was there a team doctor for three seasons. Um, and we won the championship uh, the, second, the second year. So this is the setup. This is now your, your new arena. And pre-COVID, esports events sold out arenas. They sold out football stadiums, soccer stadiums, sold more tickets than an NBA team inside the NBA team's own arena. And so this is very popular. Um, in 2020, it was uh, League of Legends, that LOL, League of Legends, it was the third most popular professional sport behind NFL and NBA which is crazy. We're talking about esports, And if, like, again, this is one of the main titles, League of Legends, third most popular professional sports league. This actually was in 2018 from Syracuse. And these numbers actually changed during COVID. But if you can see this projection that esports actually jumped the number two as far as viewership in the US. So <laughs> 84 million views across the board for America watching esports During COVID, um, when, especially when all sports stopped, what we saw on ESPN was NBA 2K League. We now are seeing professional video gamers playing basketball. We saw a lot of F1 sim racing. And so it is very interesting to see how close these numbers will be with new data that has come out um, in, in the pandemic to see if how far we esports is closer to the NFL. This is an astounding 
slide here. So this is the number of hours watched on streaming platforms. So in the gaming world, streaming is very, very popular. Um, most people have heard of Twitch. That is one main streaming platform, YouTube gaming, um, Facebook gaming. And so people typically in the gaming and esports space, they watch other people game. Um, and that's called streaming. So I would have my own setup, I would have my own camera and I'm talking, I'm showing my gameplay and I'm streaming. There were 5.7 billion hours of streaming watched on Twitch in 2021. This is wild. Meet your new streamer. If you haven't heard of Ninja, you heard of him now. Tyler Ninja Blevins is the leader of the pack. He is really leading the game from a streaming perspective. When he goes live on his streaming platform, and he actually has been bought out to go from platform to platform, he's like the LeBron James, the Serena Williams of, of, of streaming. And so when he goes live to play a video game, he typically will have over 70,000 people watching him at one time stream live. You see this bottom line, $300,000 a month just in streaming revenue. He has um, sponsorship with athletic companies, with athletic shoes, with apparel. Ninja has so much income coming in all from streaming. He's not a professional gamer, he's a professional streamer. So streaming, it's something that is just really huge. You can hear that this is a cover of ESPN Magazine and they're calling him a crossover star. So esports and gaming has certainly crossed over um, long ago. Here is another example of a traditional athlete, Ariel Powers, WNBA champion, coming over and crossing over into the esports side. And full disclosure, Ariel is one of our clients for our brand management and events management company in esports. Um, and we're very proud of what she's doing as a female, as a WNBA player, as an esports enthusiast. She is a co owner of an esports team. Um, she is the leader of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion for Team Liquid, which is the winningest esports team in the world. And so this slide really demonstrates a few things. Um, what I didn't know before I got into esports was anything about a digital divide when we're talking about communities, mostly communities of color in urban and rural areas, not having access to Wi Fi, quality Wi Fi. We saw that play out a lot during the pandemic just with school, but pre-pandemic, this digital divide was even larger. Uh, I did not know that there was a huge disparity for women in gaming. You would think this is just video gaming. I'm getting on, I'm putting on my headset, and I'm playing on my Xbox with someone else around the world somewhere. But the disparity and the bullying that happens with female gamers once people hear their voice or they see them on their stream then there's a lot of um, issues that happen where they maybe, let's just say it's NBA 2K. They're not going to pass the female player the ball, so now she can't score the points, and so now she can't win her portion of the game. So we really try hard to, and that's one of my passion points in esports, is in making sure that we're giving opportunity, um, equity, and visibility to people of color and women in gaming. This is um, a very proud slide for me because in 2019, when my hospital I was working at the time asked me to be the team doctor for our NBA 2K team, I didn't even know what it was. Uh, and they just said, Melita, can you jump on this call? I said, okay, fine. Uh, at the time I was taking care of our um, NBA G League team and our WNBA team. And I had a college that was taken care of. And I got off the call and I said, why, why was I on there? So, oh, you're gonna be their team doctor. And I had no idea why a gamer would need a team doctor. I'm working with the professional athletes. This is what's going on in my mind at that time. Why would I now come and work with gamers? But as I do, when people ask you to do a task, as I hope we all do, you just step up and you do the work. And so I really did a deep dive in 2019 about what a gamer could possibly need from a health and wellness perspective. And there really wasn't much out there in 2019 with regard to research. Um, certainly no books or very few books that were uh, about gaming and esports and health and wellness. And so I take pride in my hospital, which was Mits, our health, really um, being open. And this is where you all have the opportunity to either where you are currently in fellowship or where you're gonna to go to next. You have the opportunity to, to pave the way and really be trailblazers in this space. I told um, our sports medicine team, hey, I think we should come up with the pre-participation physical for gamers, which when our NBA 2K League um, 
they have one sheet in 2019, they had one sheet. And if you just had to sign it to say, this person is fit to play in the NBA 2K league. Well, what the heck does that mean? We don't see that what our, our soccer pre-participation physical or our football pre-participation physical. So why is it just signing a paper saying they're fit? That didn't sit well with me. So at that time we created a pre-participation physical and um, throughout that work over the past several years, I have been able to tour the world talking about health and wellness for gamers. And so on the top right, we did a healthy health e-gamer summit, um, which is our nonprofit. We did that in Ghana, really educating um, the youth there in Ghana about the importance of being healthy and well and how you can do that with, with esports and talking about healthy digital lifestyles. On the left, I was in Saudi Arabia with the Global Esports Federation. We had a mobile PUBG tournament and I got to talk about health and wellness. And on the bottom right, I spoke at the World Expo in Dubai in November about esports and the metaverse. And I just really have to sit back and think about my very humble beginnings in sports. And I did my sports medicine fellowship at UC Davis in 2009. And to see kind of how my life has transformed, how sports has transformed me over this um, decade is really mind blowing to say I'm, I'm speaking at the World Expo um, and not about sports, not about concussion. I'm talking about esports. Um, so if there's anyone that's interested, there's a new world that's out here and you get to create and build whatever you want um, when you have the passion for it. So we're gonna talk about some health concerns. And so typically when you say, oh, we're talking about um, health and wellness for gamers, everyone, almost everyone says, oh, what do you do? Just treat carpal tunnel. And it really makes me angry, um, but I take a breath. And I understand that a lot of people just aren't educated about it. And it's, it is not an ignorance on their part. Um, it's just people don't really know. So these are some of the topics that we are going to talk about. Mental health is huge. And so typically when I am speaking about overall well-being or healthy digital lifestyles, I really put mental health up top. This is pre-pandemic before mental health became its own crisis and its own pandemic. Um, and when we talk about mental health in esports, there's negative and positive sides. So our very first year of our team, our um, NBA 2K team, they had a sports psychologist. And if you look at the professional industry of esports, a lot of the professional teams, they may have one medical professional and it's usually a sports psychologist. And so um, we are starting to see that slowly shift to where they are expanding um, their medical team. But when we talk about mental health, I take it all back to cognitive wellness. Everything centers around cognitive wellness, I think, when you talk about a gamer. Um, although they're sitting and they're playing and you don't really see them exercising, their heart rate gets up just as high as a professional athlete on the basketball court or a football field when they're actually in game play. And so when we talk about kind of these positive benefits of sports psychology, if you can imagine, this is a person usually at their home playing alone, and then they get into a professional league. And so now they're immediately on a team when they've never been on a team sport before. They've never been in the spotlight. They've never been on the stage in front of tens of thousands of people. You can imagine how that all just kind of can come crashing down on someone. And so a lot of the sports psychology is, is just like we do in trad traditional sports, talking about focus and attention, um, visualization, really talking about how you get in the zone, but not go past the zone and how to be a team player um, and how teamwork happens. And so that's a lot of what happens initially when, they when you come onto a team. This other important piece is the social emotional benefits of gaming. And this is where it goes down actually into um, the youth. And so what we are seeing a lot in elementary and middle school is gaming being brought into the curriculum, whether that's Minecraft, whether it's Roblox, it's really kind of those strategy games, um, but the social emotional benefits and the connectedness that happens with gaming, especially during the pandemic, you people were getting on their headsets and they were talking to people all day, every day, more socialization than they ever would. And so what some of the re early research has shown is that for the youth who game, they actually have better social skills than kids who don't. Um, they have better hand-eye coordination, problem-solving skills. And so there really are some great benefits to gaming. Um, now, on the flip side of that, of course, there's the negative connotation that can come around the mental health of gaming and professional esports. 
and depression, anxiety are certainly the top two. Um, and then the social isolation. Again, people are used to being at home um, by themselves playing this game. And so they may not be going out publicly or engaging with their community. And so this is some of the negative parts of mental health. Gaming disorder is really a controversial topic um, in, in the gaming space. I know it came out as an ICD code um, and that really met the community with an uproar because we feel like the gaming disorder, the, the definition is really um, quite strict and really robust. Not to say that gaming disorder doesn't happen. We have seen a lot of gaming disorder when we do see it coming out of the Asia market. Um, but overall, gaming disorder, we really don't put too much um, talk or speak into just because I don't really feel that it's gotten its fair shake um, because we don't really know the esports in the gaming industry. This is one thing. This is the second most important thing. This is what I learned a lot. And so typically in our sports medicine fellowship, we're not really doing much about vision unless we're talking about concussion. Um, but we never talk, well, I didn't hear about computer vision syndrome or digital eye strain. And so this was something that was new to me. And I made sure that with our pre-participation physical, we had an ophthalmologist there um, to do a really good eye exam. If you can imagine, professional gamers are sitting and looking at their screen 10 to 16 hours a day. That's their practice time. Imagine all of that blue light that is coming from that screen, the glare, the eye fatigue, your ancillary, your, excuse me, your ciliary muscles get weak and they start to um, have a glare come over them. You get dry eye and you start to do more blinking. Vision is really, really big. We all actually need to um, check ourselves about digital eye strain. Before the pandemic, corporate America workers were usually working on computers seven to eight hours a day. Um, through the pandemic, we all have found ourselves more on computer screens just like today. And so everything that we're talking about from a gaming perspective really flips over to what everyone in the world is really going through right now. It's just really talking about healthy digital lifestyles. One thing we can do to try to avoid this computer vision syndrome, this digital eye strain is the 2020 rule. If you take nothing else away from this conversation today, I want you to remember the 2020 rule because you can pass this one to your patients, pass it on to yourself. Um, and it's every 20 minutes, you look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And so I usually will tell people, you know, you can pace out 20 feet if you want, but you post something on the wall or on the floor that's 20 feet away that you've already measured. Sometimes I'll tell people to set a reminder, set your alarm. You know, you're going to be in a long work day or if you're gaming for a long time, set an alarm every 20 minutes. Of course, during gameplay, no one's going to do this. Um, but for practice and practice sessions, every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away from the screen for 20 seconds. And what that does, it actually resets um, your eye and it resets the ciliary muscles so that you don't have as much fatigue. Some other things that we can do, gaming glasses. Do they work? Yes. How well do they work? I'm not for sure. Um, so there's still a lot of research that needs to be done on gaming glasses. I actually have a pair of glasses um, that I went to the optometrist for that are blue light blocking glasses um, without a prescription. It's just because I know it's on the computer screen so much. So there are different qualities um, of gaming glasses, so many different brands. So that's one thing if you're going to be educating your, um, especially if as you have a younger, a younger patient, I maybe will recommend, I mean, you can get a pair for $5 um, online, or you can get a really nice pair for $100. But do they work to help block some of the blue light? Yes. How much? I'm not sure. Um, the other thing you can do is you hold the object further away. So instead of being so close on your phone or having your computer so close, make sure your objects are further away. Myopia is a huge problem that we're seeing worldwide. The World Health Organization actually has a full um, program dedicated to myopia. We are seeing a huge increase in that um, in Singapore. They have kids that, be, it was interesting, some of their statistics that the kids under the age of one and how many hours a day that they have screen time. Um, and so myopia is really a, a big deal uh, internationally. Some of the musculoskeletal things that we see, again, it is not carpal tunnel that jumps out. And so let that be a takeaway also. Um, it's very interesting. If you can imagine just your setup now and how you are, and you're typically throughout the workday, you're on the computer, you're typing, you're doing your notes, or if you are gaming um, and you're on your PC or you're on your controller, it can bring about different musculoskeletal um, issues. 
So this upper cross syndrome, that was something that was new to me. It's uh, physical therapy really uses this word um, a lot and this diagnosis a lot. Um, and we'll show a photo of that when we're talking about neck and back. If you can imagine sitting in this chair for 10 to 12 hours a day and you don't really get up that much, you're gonna have neck pain and low back pain. We see some spondylosis. We see a lot of lower lumbar um, radiculopathy from prolonged sitting. From the wrist, it's very interesting. Um, we see a lot of ECU tendonitis. We see some TFCC. So depending on the type of gameplay that you're doing, if you're on a PC, um, usually with your left hand, you're doing a lot of movement, a lateral motion. And so you're getting a lot of irritation overuse. So what we see in gaming is really um, tendinopathies, a lot of overuse syndromes. Hopefully we are starting to hit those a little bit before um, they become an itis. Uh, and just a little bit of a symptom before they actually um, become a true diagnosis. We can see a lot of intersection syndrome. When you imagine just on the mouse and seeing a lot of intersection syndrome, gaming thumb is decrovane's tenosynovitis or texting thumb or selfie thumb, um, and then a lot of CMCOA. And so when we are talking about professional gamers and professional esports athletes, unfortunately, they retire around the age of 22 to 25. That is a very short lifespan. And it's usually from overuse injuries, burnout, fatigue, um, you know, versus we see professional athletes that really focus on their recovery or focus on um, their rehab or how to sustain longer gameplay. And so right now it's really about education for your gamers that are coming into the office and really for esports teams and organizations. You know that you don't see Naomi Osaka out on a tennis court hitting balls for 12 hours a day. So why would you have to game and practice for 12 hours a day on the screen? Actually, NYIT came out with a really nice research article um, that even a six minute break in between your gaming, a six minute walk in between your gaming actually helps to improve your play. And so we need to tell people, start to um, take breaks. Don't game as long. Usually after about five hours of gaming, your performance starts to go down. So gaming longer does not equal better play. This is also something that's very specific for esports. And so when we talk about keybinds or grips, it's really kind of going to like performance art medicine. Um, and when you talk about the performing arts, you need to know what type of instrument your patient plays so that you know the very specific hand motions or neck motions if they're playing a violin or if they're on the guitar. So it's almost similar to performance arts um, where you really have to know what game you're, and you don't have to be familiar with the game. Uh, you know, I have some pages come in. I don't know what they're talking about. But I say, well, show me what your setup is. Um, and so you see, I didn't just misspell some, just type some random words here on the screen. This WASD. So if you look down at your computer screen, or if you look at this photo, you see the hand placement. Usually it's the left hand, um, whether the person's right or left hand, it's usually the left hand. And you will place your um, middle finger on the W key. And so on the WASD, and that's really the keys that you use depending on what game that you're playing to like do an attack move or to move your, your avatar around. So it's a very common key bind. So you can imagine and also hitting the shift button. So you're getting a lot of overuse here on this ulnar side doing motions like this. Um, if you're on the controller, like you see on the left side, if you have a traditional grip like it is up top versus on the bottom. Can you see how his finger is kind of this claw grip on the controller? Just imagine how much the EIP is working if you're moving it all around. So it's really about knowing um, the key binds. Not co so common are on the right side are the I, J, K, L buttons. It's really the W, A, S, D. Um, but also the different grips that you use on the mouse. Is it a palm grip? Is it a claw grip or a fingertip grip? So when you're talking about esports medicine, it is imperative that you learn what your patient is doing, what kind of setup they have. Is it a controller or a PC? How do they grip the mouse? What's their key bind? So you can have a really idea where to focus your, your exam. So this is upper cross syndrome. So you can see the cross here where they kind of have the upper back muscles crossing over with the tight pecs. And so you're in this forward posture, which is terrible. The neck muscles, their flexors are, are weaker. And then you have your mid back muscles because you are, are so hunched over, you're not really engaged in your rhomboids or your serratus anterior. And so from this terrible posture, you can start to get this upper cross syndrome. This is treated um, very well with physical therapy. And you can see on the right, I am in it. I'm not really a gamer, um, but you can see it's a really bad posture. 
this is the approved posture. So when you talk about ergonomics, it's really important from your workstation at home to people's gaming stations that you make sure that you have a neutral spine, your feet are flat on the floor, although not in this picture, um, your elbows are to your side. And so in my gaming chair, I've set this up to where I have a very good posture here. And this chair goes all the way back, it comes forward. So you get a quality gaming chair that really can make the difference. And so if you have a patient who is an avid gamer or they are really um, grinding to make it to a professional level, then you wanna make sure that they have quality um, seating. It, they can be very expensive. And so if it's a casual gamer, just making sure they have a nice chair, just like a regular chair that has some support. Dr. Mario says this is good. Um, these are very, very simple things to, to, to talk to your patients. And so this is just like any other injury that may come into your office, any other symptom, upper extremity, you really need to know your upper extremity anatomy, anatomy really well when you're talking about esports and gaming. Yes, low back, lower extremity, we do that a lot, but when you really are getting into the fine details of the upper extremity, you can give your patients an exercise prescription. Um, sometimes they need to go to hand therapy, but these are some very simple things that you can do uh, to give them their, and their patient instructions, their post-visit instructions to say, hey, before you start the game, make sure you do a warm-up. You wouldn't let you, any of your athletic teams get on the field or get on the court without warming up. You just don't do that. We know that increases injury. So when you're gaming, you need to have a proper warm up and a proper cool down. And so these are very basic that you can tell anyone. They don't need to work with a therapist to know this. This is a, one of our athletic trainers here with the Washington Wizards who does a lot of, who does a lot of um, the esports talks with me. And so that's Carlos in the picture and doing some very gentle neck stretching, this kind of middle and right picture that's kind of the turtle where you stick your neck out really far. Oh, it feels good. Go ahead and get that stretch here in the anterior neck and then pulling your neck back to give it that double chin. So that's really engaging the posterior and anterior muscles. So this is a beautiful neck stretch. This always feels so good. You should be doing this too, maybe in the middle of clinic or while you're listening to these long lectures. Um, just again, reminding yourself that you need to be stretching. We are, everyone is now sitting much more. Wrist and forearm stretching, um, this is key. And so even just now, you haven't gained, well, maybe you have gained today. I haven't gained today, um, but I've been on my computer a lot. So even in doing this, you feel that really good stretch. These are very simple things that you know how to do. You know how to show your patient. You can give them a TheraBand if you want um, while they're in clinic to say, take home and start to do some of these very simple stretching exercises. Finger stretching, it looks weird, but you certainly wanna make sure that you're getting a really good stretch on all of your muscles here um, and all of your fingers because this is what's doing most of the work. When we talk about ergonomics and, and really a good setup for gamers, you know, there's a lot of elbow issues that come, um, a lot of lateral, lateral epicondylosis just from mousing so much and it's usually all right-sided. Like I said, even people are left-handed when they game, they usually are mousing with their right and doing the WSD keys with the left. And so we'll see a lot um, of either um, hypertrophy of the forearm muscles, some lateral epicondylosis, certainly some olecranon bursitis just from sitting and rubbing their elbow either in their gaming chair or on their desk, just an improper setup. Um, and so some, those are some of the key sites to make sure that people are aware of. Very simple, get a rubber band. We tell people to do this all the time for various things. All this information you already know, you're just switching your brain over to say, I'm now talking to a gamer about doing this. Um, and so doing some simple stretches with the rubber band on the bottom, this is a bucket of, of rice um, to do some strengthening exercises with the wrist, to do some strengthening exercises of the fingers. So nothing fancy, nothing sophisticated or expensive. Everyone can do these techniques at home uh, to make sure that they are preparing themselves for a gaming session. This is absolutely needed. You know, when you sit for a long period of time, your hamstrings shorten, you can have some low back pain. And so making sure that you are stretching forward, stretching out your hamstrings, your quads, doing this uh, figure of four stretch to really get those glutes really well, such a good stretch. But for people who are seated for a prolonged period of time, uh, they need to be doing the stretching before, during, and after. We also want to encourage everyone, stand up. Stand up, take a break in between each game, depending on what, what type of genre or what title they're, they're playing. That game could last three minutes or it could last 30 minutes. And it's just saying after every game, 
just stand up. Sleep, this is huge. Um, and everything kind of that we're talking about today for healthy digital lifestyles for esports medicine really falls under lifestyle medicine. Um, all these things are what we talk about when giving someone a really good lifestyle medicine prescription. But sleep is huge in the esports and gaming community. There's not much of it. Um, people are usually gaming. And so we'll say, well, that's the gamer hour. So usually gamers will go to bed late, late, early, excuse me, late night, very early morning, um, and then have a later afternoon. But with all of the blue light that's coming, it's impacting their sleep. Um, and so we do know that when you don't have sleep, when you sleep well, when you have quality sleep, it's not necessarily about the quantity, it's about the quality of sleep. That when you have great rest, it decreases your stress level, you can perform better. It decreases your risk of heart disease and stroke. And when you think about these esports athletes, they are sedentary. It's a sedentary activity. Yes, their heart is racing for certain things during gameplay, but it's sedentary. And so there is a, a risk of obesity um, in the gaming community. What we are starting to see, so that narrative of it's a young boy overweight in his parents' basement eating Doritos and drinking a pop, that's not, we're shifting that narrative, which is really great. So what we're starting to see with streamers and some of the esports athletes, they're showing their workouts. They are actually making sure that they are healthy. They're eating well. They're talking about healthy snacks. They're getting into the gym. And so even with our NBA 2K team, we had them actually it's on their own. They, they shot basketball together three days a week. We had them work out with our exercise performance person three days a week. So getting in this exercise, we know exercise helps you sleep and it helps you perform better. The blue light, and this is another thing of why maybe the game, the blue light classes are good for people, or if you have it on your computer, having a screen, um, a protector to block the blue light, or even on your phone, putting on a blue light filter. These things are really important. Um, we know that it decreases melatonin. Now it's going to throw your sleep pattern off. When you don't sleep, everyone's cranky, but you also can't focus as well. Um, you're not as rested. Your, your stress level goes up a bit. Um, it disrupts your internal body clock. And so when we talk about, especially for esports, if you think about this, just like any other traditional professional league, they, they play across the world. They don't just play from city to city. So some of these teams fly internationally. The travel schedule is very demanding, not much room in there for sleep or for travel. And just like the NFL did a couple of years ago um, about really being cognizant of the travel schedule, sleep schedule, like recovery schedule, we are telling the esports tournament organizers, you really need to be cognizant of that schedule. Sleep is so important. Um, we know it makes it much more difficult to, to learn. And then when you have decreased melatonin, it increases your hunger. So now we're already talking about increasing obesity for a population that is sedentary. So this blue light is not good, y'all. So get something to block your blue light if you haven't already. Um, and so some things that we can do is really talking about a good sleep hygiene. And so, and I write a prescription for this for my patients. Usually we probably, you all too, um, for your concussion um, patients about a good sleep hygiene because we know sleep is impacted with that and their internal clock is off. But setting a, setting a schedule. When you're talking to a professional gamer, it's hard for them to do, but you still tell them um, they need to set a, set a sleep schedule, get off of any device at least an hour before it's time for you to go to sleep um, so that you're not getting so much stimulation. And then I love to use a diffuser. I tell everyone, use a diffuser. So about four hours before you know you want to start to go to sleep, put in some eucalyptus, some lavender, and it really just permeates the air and it starts to get your body relaxed and starts to promote sleep. These are very simple things to do. If you don't have this on your prescription for your uh, post-concussion patients, you should. And also if you have any gamers that are coming in. Nutrition is key. And this is where I think you can make a big impact and difference when you are educating these gamers. What is also very interesting in this esports world at this professional level, there's not a pipeline of gaming like we have with AAU basketball or Pop Warner football. So they haven't come up in a system where they talk, where we talk about nutrition and the importance of exercise and sleep. They are just now getting this information. They may be in their late teens, early 20s, and they're just now talking about nutrition and why you should exercise. And so with this younger generation starting to gain, we now have the opportunity to capture them at a younger age and start to teach them the right things to do so that when they get older, 
hopefully they would have adopted a healthier lifestyle and healthy lifestyle behaviors. And so when you're talking about eye health, I also put this in my patient instructions, I already have it um, as a dot phrase, so that they can remember their eye health, vitamin ACE, A-C-E is how I tell them to remember it, um, and giving them some, in, some um, foods that specifically have those vitamins. These are all snackable. Most of these are snackable. So instead of reaching for that potato chip, maybe you have a lentil chip, or maybe you already have some pre-cut strawberries. So when you talk to gamers and their whole goal is about performance, they just wanna perform better, gain better. When you start to talk about the benefits of eye health and of brain health, they kind of become shocked that they didn't know that there were specific foods that they could be eating to intentionally improve their vision and their brain health. And so for brain health, I tell them vitamin bed, B-E-D. And so I just usually break it down that way give them these, um, these options for food and talk about substituting at least one snack a day for one of these and at least then talking about a meal a day and slowly starting to introduce it that way so it's palatable to people. This is very important, especially for the pediatric population um, and for adults too, but really for the younger generation, we know that kids need to be exercising at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise a day. Um, this pediatric inactivity triad, it's, it, it is um, endemic here in, in the U.S. and certainly across the world. Um, I'm actually in working with um, UNESCO on a program called Fit for Life, and it's a 10-year program engaging youth and women, really focused on the youth, how to get them active um, using digital strategies and healthy digital lifestyles. And so we know that childhood obesity is up. Um, kids are not going out and exercising. And I tell parents all the time, let your kids gain. That's, that's no problem, as long as they're exercising. Put the controller down, go outside and play and come back in. Um, and so this is something we still need to be pushing and focusing. We all know exercise is medicine, um, and especially in this younger population. So let's go ahead and gain your life away as long as you've done your homework and you've gotten your exercise in for the day. Um, and so these are just some simple things that we can tell them to do for adults, of course, 30 minutes a day. It's harder to tell the adults sometime to go exercise than it is the kids or to get the buy-in from the parents of why the kids should be exercising. Um, but it is important not only for your health, your physical health, your mental health, but also to improve your performance. I did not create this slide, which is why you see esports is, is spelled uh, incorrectly. But I think this is a great photo of this multidisciplinary team that we're used to working with in sports medicine. And so this is very similar to um, the team that I was able to set up at MedStar for our pre-participation physicals. We had a sports medicine doctor, we had orthopedic hand, we had a hand surgeon, an ophthalmologist, um, a vision therapist, exercise physiology, uh, sports performance. We had our full research team there and our sports psychologist for six athletes, but that's what we do for our other 15 professional basketball players. Why would we not do it for our six professional esports athletes? And so just talking through all the things that we mentioned today, um, and, and nutritionists is on here, um, it really is a multidisciplinary effort. Um, right now, World Health Organization has um, a brand new um, initiative called Safe Hearing. And so again, of most people who are gaming have the headphones on, they're turned up really loud. And so now we're starting to bring an audiology into the conversation and making sure that we have safe hearing now so that we can hear in the future. Um, and so all these things come into the care of taking care of professional gamer and people are shocked to understand and to hear how much goes into it. One other thing I just wanna make sure to note is that gaming is accessible to everyone. And I'm so proud um, of this slide. I know it doesn't look so great. I'm not the most tech person, but to know that uh, Mount Sinai in New York, Nike actually sponsors um, an adaptive esports team. There are teams that um, are Paris and they use their uh, sip straw um, actually to move their, their character. And so when you talk to your younger patients or anyone um, who may not be the healthiest or the tallest or the biggest, Gaming is for everyone. And so I always wanna make sure that we know and that we are promoting adaptive esports um, and accessibility because I think it's really important. There's particular um, controllers and keyboards and um, mice that are um, adaptive and it's really impressive. This is uh, the Handbook of Esports Medicine. As Dana mentioned, I'm one of the co-editors. I really have to give the credit to Dr. Lindsay Miglior um, who at the time was my resident at MedStar Health. 
um, who is a huge gamer. She's called the Gamer Doc. Um, and this was really her idea, her baby, um, and Caitlin McGee, who is a physical therapist here in the area. Um, they really did a bulk of the writing, the authorship, but I was very uh, honored to be one of the co-editors of Handbook of Esports Medicine's first book of its kind. And so if you are interested in esports, this is not a plug for the book. This is just really for learning. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to learn more about um, esports medicine. And just one other thing I, I'll share is when you have your, your patients come in or they're with their parents and they're complaining about them gaming all the time, you can now go to college uh, on a scholarship for gaming. And so in 2021, there was $9 million of scholarship money given to esports teams in over 150 universities and colleges in the US. And so this is not a game, no, no pun really intended. Um, this is really serious. And so if you have someone who's interested, um, you should really promote and, and encourage them to keep gaming, healthy gaming, um, because they can go to college. There's so many different verticals and things that you can do within esports outside of just being a gamer, but now you can go to college. So that is a, a very quick overview of esports medicine. Um, thanks, Dr. Tanji. And uh, I'm open to any questions. I know, Dana, we, we may take some questions from the chat or you have some already. Yes, thanks so much, Dr. Moore. That was great. Um, I'm sure we all, including me, learned a lot about the whole world of esports medicine, all the different aspects of health that are involved. And thanks for also touching on the importance of inclusion in sports, including esports. Um, for everyone, I'm putting a link in the chat right now. That's for feedback, if you could fill that out. Uh, Dr. Moore, I do have a few questions. The first one is, how did you get involved with NBA 2K? And for anyone who's interested in getting involved with esports, how do you recommend getting started? I was voluntold. I was voluntold by my hospital. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, when talking with um, Dr. Brandy Wade at UC Davis, when I was told her, oh, I have to take care of this video gaming team, it's really talking about, I could have potentially blocked my blessing there to say, oh, I don't want to do this. I just said, yes, I was voluntold to do it. And I think, and I asked why me? Um, and I think because of, of my background with, um, you know, PM&R and sports and brain injury and really lifestyle medicine. How can you get involved? So that's very interesting. At the professional level, um, in 2019, I was the only team physician for a professional esports team in the U.S. Currently, we have Dr. Lindsay Miglior, who's a director of player performance um, for Evil Geniuses, which is a professional team. For the other professional teams, they really have a sports psychologist or a director of player performance. They have not quite gotten there yet to understand that you need a team position, you need an athletic trainer, you need all of these people. And it's interesting because most of the owners of these professional esports teams are owners of traditional professional teams. You put the value and you invest in the product. The product are the athletes. Um, so at a professional level, it's still really hard to get some experience. Uh, I would say start to get in some research because that is really an area that um, is starting to grow. There's an the International Journal of Esports Medicine. Um, there are a couple other journals that are out there. NYIT, UC Irvine, they are really pumping out a lot of the research in the U.S. Um, from that perspective. It's hard to break in right now. And so it's kind of if you, if you know a gamer or someone that's streaming, then maybe you can start to get on their stream and talk about healthy gaming or talk about, hey, you should do this um, because the professional bubble hasn't burst just yet. And we have a related question from Kong Kong. He said, it, can you talk more about coverage of esports, including training room, sideline compensation? Yeah, so um, for me, for with, with my hospital, um, there wasn't really any compensation because it was just kind of, we take care of all these professional teams, but um, outside of this me with an NBA 2K league, uh, I don't know what the compensation is because like I said, right now it's either um, exercise like physiology, like performance-based people uh, or sports psychologists that are really on the medical team. And it's really just a person of one and a lot of times. Um, but what is the sideline coverage like? So I had no idea, like I told you what NBA 2K was. So I flew across the country from DC to Las Vegas to a tournament 
And because I said, well, if I'm taking care of these players, I need to know what the hell do they do? And so I actually went to a live esports event. Um, and then, of course, then the pandemic came. We actually just had one on behalf of Global Esports Federation in Singapore, and it's just live. Um, and I found myself yelling at the screams, like, pick up the ball, pick up the dribble. Like, and, and so I think if you are wanting to get into esports, a great way to do that is with sports titles. So whether that's FIFA, um, NBA 2K, Madden. So at least you know the sport. And now you're kind of going into the electronic version of that versus picking up and talking about League of Legends or Dota 2. Uh, so if you want to kind of slowly kind of dip your toe in, I think it's easier to start with some of the sport specific um, games. But we have a we have a long way to go. It starts by having talks like this um, that we can hopefully then be on the main stage uh, talking about esports medicine. That would be great. And we have a also related question from Edwin. He says, as far as the pre-participation physicals go for esports, what would you recommend adding slash changing on the current high school forms? Anything physically that we should look out for or keep an eye out for? Yeah, I think this is when you really focus in on your upper extremity physical exam. I think that that's key. Um, if you have the opportunity to have a vision therapist there with you to really do some very quick, high level um, testing, that would be great because um, you don't need necessarily the orthopedic hand surgery. I mean, we were just being extra biased. I said, let me just bring everyone to the table that I think would really fit this team. But from like a high school per, um, um, pre-participation physical, I would focus on upper extremity, your upper extremity exam. I think vision, we absolutely need to be checking um, and a mental health screen. Another question from Edwin, any data on issues with virtual reality gaming? So I'm not um, too sure about any issues so far. We, that's still kind of in its infancy. People might kill me for saying that in that world. But what we are starting to see um, and what we saw in the, in the, in the Olympics um, this past year was active esports, what we're calling virtual esports. And so it was just a demonstration um, actually in August at the Commonwealth um, Games, which is the third largest sporting event in the world behind the Olympics and World Cup, uh, the Commonwealth Games, 74 countries and territories, that is in um, the UK in August. And actually the Global Esports Federation is putting on a Commonwealth Esports Championship. So we're going to start to see that more. But I like the VR, AR world because now we're talking about active esports or virtual esports. So now we get exercise and activity and gaming all in one. So it's kind of doing a full circle, talking about more of a healthy digital lifestyle. Another question from Kong Kong. Any advice for college students on their school's esport team looking for national accreditation, things like listing under the school athletic department with the associated funding, et cetera? Yeah, so collegiate esports is, is, is interesting. It's not a sanctioned sport by the NCAA, which means that Title IX is not in existence. And so 90 plus percent of the scholarships have gone to um, men and not women. And so uh, I think some schools are trying to fight to get it sanctioned as a sport. Either they have their own esports team or clubs. So there is something called NACE, National Athletic Collegiate Esports. Um, which is really uh, the really big body for most of the colleges that offer scholarships. That also may be a great place for anyone who wants to volunteer um, to tap into and email them. I, I spoke at their conference in 2019. So kind of all the stuff pre-pandemic um, when people were meeting in person, now we are back to meeting. But I think that might be a great place to start with the, you know, volunteer, like we do every, for everything else in sports medicine, we're always doing volunteer coverage. And so this is a way for you to kind of get in maybe with your collegiate team. There's a huge um, high school league called Play Versus or Play VS, which um, has a lot of high school teams that are around. So just like Friday night football, you can be covering your esports team. Do they really need you there? Who knows? But it's really about having a presence and starting to show that we are there um, and starting to do some education and awareness. And so that would be a great place to start, actually. That was a lot of resources. We might need a <laughs> list later. <laughs> sure. Uh, we got a couple more questions that came in. One is from Adrian. Um, how do you recommend starting a wellness program for our local university esports team or maybe even our local high school team? I've read this population might be initially resistant to care. How would you recommend overcoming this? 
Um, it's about fun. And you so you can't you can't take the fun out of gaming and esports. And I think that's the biggest thing to take away when you're talking about healthy digital lifestyles. You still have to talk about the fun in it. You have to let them know you're not coming to shut them down, not coming to have them eat um, cucumbers and carrots. But it's really about education. Like I said before, this is there's no pipeline for for gaming, so they haven't had that training that younger kids have had in different sports. Um, I think it's so a lot of for the college level, if it's a club team or even for their esports team, um, it's usually a professor from the school. And so some of the schools, you know, they have their own sites up if it's a really a team versus a club sport. Um, so I would recommend getting in contact or finding the contact information for the coach and just talking about, can I come in and give a talk or can I do a, a Zoom talk to your players about what they can be doing to level up um, to make their gameplay better? And that's really how I brought it to our athletes. And luckily out of our six players, three had played in, in high school or college, like traditional sports. So they kind of got it, but it's just really about how I can make you perform better. Cause that's really at the end of the day, what it's about. And then you can kind of brace it that way. And related to playing better, we have a question from Jair. It, like in most competitive sports, there's always those looking for that competitive edge can you speak on some of the pharmacologic agents, legal and illegal, yeah. that might be used in the esports world? Any discussion or need for possible drug screening? Obviously, difficult to do without any governing body. Yeah, and that's it. There is no governing body for esports, um, and the esports community doesn't want one. And so that's the, the what I have found, and I am learning is that the esports community they are very true. They are genuine, they are authentic, and they don't want you bringing in anything that's not authentic to them or to the space. And so there isn't a governing body. This has been a huge topic of debate globally um, about drug screening. What I can tell you is that a large percent of the gamers will come positive for stimulants. So Ritalin is huge. I mean, the stimulants are really big in the um, professional esports realm. It is a quiet topic that's not spoken about. Um, it's a drug of abuse. So stimulants are certainly a drug of abuse. Caffeine is a drug of abuse. Um, energy drinks are one of the biggest sponsors and promoters. So I never promote um, the energy drinks. If you want to do caffeine, let's get quality coffee. Let's do green tea. Let's find some other natural ways, some dark chocolate, throw those things in to make sure you can still get your caffeine boost. Um, but I never really promote the energy drinks. And that's something I don't think we should be promoting either. Um, it's just not safe for, for this population or for anyone. But certainly there is a underground, um, well-known fact that um, stimulants are drugs of abuse. And I'm gonna combine my question with the last question that I see here from Hamilton. Um, so his is, do you see any significant differences in pathology with different gaming genres like first person shooters versus racing versus fighting games? And then mine was, do you, have you seen, I guess, more injuries with certain uh, consoles versus others? The research is lacking. So I don't even have an answer to that, but these are great research projects. And I certainly, because we see a lot of overuse, that's really what we are seeing from a musculoskeletal standpoint. And so that's now we're talking about doing an ultrasound um, and let's do a you know preseason ultrasound and postseason ultrasound and, and use a target. You know, we did some research about quality of life studies um, with our team. So this is where the research can happen. This is where you should be trying to jump on it and talk to some of your attendings and say, hey, can we do this project? Most of us, we are all getting ultrasound training. Um, we know how to look at tendons, um, nerves really well. So we're talking about uh, ulnar neuritis, carpal tunnel, um, those kind of things. And so, uh, I don't. The research just doesn't show just yet because there's not much that has been that has been done on that um, with regard to is there a certain genre that's showing more tendinopathy or tendinopathic tendonies than the other. All right, so Hamilton, that's your next research project. Get on it, Hamilton. <laughs> yeah. So we've gone through uh, all our questions. There, there was a lot of interest. Uh, I that's certainly good. learned a lot in this. So thank you so much. Um, we have yes, more fantastic talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Dr. Tanji, my mentor. I love you. you I'm, I am because of you. So thank you. And Dana, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. All Bye. right, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.